We're going to go into our sermon now. Uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, that's where we're going to start. Uh, do you have any memories of opening presents as a child? One year for Christmas, uh, when I was, I think, 9 or 10 years old, uh, I vividly recall that I received a remote control race car, uh, a, a box of magic tricks, a slinky, and a package of socks. Now, I think I asked Santa for the remote control race car and the box of magic tricks, and everyone loves a slinky, right? Uh, so that was okay, too. But I wondered, where'd the socks come from? Um, why am I getting socks? Uh, but then I remember looking down at my feet, and I saw a big toe sticking out of a hole in my sock. <laughs> so apparently, Santa really knew what I needed. Now, my life is not newsworthy, um, so this would never happen to me, but if four reporters were at my home that morning to report on what I received for Christmas, and one of them were to say he got a remote control race car, and another one were to say he got a magic trick box, and another he got a slinky, and the last he got a package of socks that he really, really needed, who would be right? Well, they would all be right, right? Um, there were four accounts of the same event, and while they all reported on different details, they all reported what really happened. The Bible is the same way. In the Bible, we have four accounts of the life of Jesus. The Gospels, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, each one of them tells us many of the same stories, and, and each one emphasizes the story of Jesus in a unique way. This morning, we're going to look at how each of the four Gospels helps us to worship God by telling us the story of Jesus. So let's pray, and then we'll dig into how the Bible uh, talks about the birth of Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we read your word this morning, and as we reflect on the first Christmas, help us to be in awe of Jesus. Help us to see how perfect and powerful and good Jesus is, so that we might all rest in him, and so that we might all have perfect joy and peace in Jesus. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, even though it's the last of the Gospels, um, it was, and, and was probably written after all the other ones, we're, we're going to start, like I said, in the book of John this morning, because it addresses events that actually happened, uh, took place far before Jesus' birth on the earth. Uh, usually when we talk about Christmas, we talk about what happened on a night 2,000 years ago. And of course, we're going to be looking at that this morning. But when the book of John addresses the idea of Jesus being born on the earth, John backed up all the way to before the beginning of the earth. Uh, because the thing is, Jesus has no beginning. And Jesus existed even before the earth began. John wrote this in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now skip down to verse 14. It says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John is clear that this word with a capital W is Jesus. Jesus is the word of God and is God in the flesh. So the thing that John tells us about Christmas is that the birth of Jesus was not the beginning of Jesus. In reality, Jesus is the beginning of everything. Have you ever noticed how sometimes even a good story is hard to follow? Um, I just finished reading the book Les Miserables, and it was a great story. Um, but it took me a really long time to finish. And that's because sometimes it was just a little hard to follow. Um, it was full of French history and, and politics and wars, and I just didn't see how all of it related all that much. When little kids are just starting to learn how to read uh, and have short attention spans, uh, the authors of children's books add a lot of pictures to help them stay focused and to help them understand more of what they read. I guess what I'm saying is that I think I could have finished Les Miserables a lot faster if only it had a few pictures in it. 
It was a great book, but it needed some good illustrations. That's part of what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to illustrate what God's word is. Uh, This is what we call the doctrine of the incarnation. It means that God, who has always existed and is Lord over all, at a moment in history, took on human flesh so that we might see his glory, which is full of grace and truth. This truth alone ought to fill us with such reverent awe of Jesus that consumes our whole lives and causes us to want to live for him alone. I mean, God himself became one of us so that we could know him and be saved from our sins and saved from hell by grace through faith in him. It's interesting that so many people celebrate Christmas, but so few people actually celebrate Christ. Most of you know that I teach English online to children who live in China. Uh, To teach them English, we talk about various topics. Some of the lessons that I teach deal with various holidays, and one of those holidays is Christmas. And whenever I ask the children why we celebrate Christmas, so few of them know that it's about Jesus. Most of them think it's about Santa and presents and sometimes spending time with family, those sorts of things. Uh, and, And I'm sure that a lot of that has to do with China's culture and how atheistic they are as a country. But I, I wonder if we were to ask the same thing in our country, just how many children in America would know that Christmas is about Christ? Church, we have a great responsibility and privilege to celebrate Christmas, not just with presents and meals and parties, but by celebrating the birth of Jesus. So let's look at that story. We'll be reading it from both Matthew and Luke, reading them together to make one chronological story, uh, starting with Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says this, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who has been called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now skip to Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 25. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear his son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. Now flip back over to Luke. Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Matthew 1.25. 
and he called his name Jesus. Now, obviously, there are other parts of the story that we could read, such as when Mary visited Elizabeth and when the wise men visited Jesus two years later, but that's the main story. And I hope that no matter how many times you've heard that story, you still see how precious and perfect it really is. Every detail of the story of Jesus' birth was orchestrated by God so that it fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, and it all came together at just the right moment in human history. We've been talking these last few weeks at church about how good the gospel is. The angel announced that the birth of Jesus was good news of great joy that shall be for all the people. So, we have a bunch of people gathered online this morning. If the birth of Jesus is good news of great joy that shall be for all the people, and we're some of those people, then it seems reasonable to say that we should all have great joy in the good news. So, take a few seconds to rate your joy on this joyometer. How much joy do you have? Do you have no joy, or great joy, or somewhere in between? Maybe you have some joy when you see your family open presents, but, but little to no joy when you couldn't have a big gathering this year because of COVID-19. Or, or maybe you have a lot of joy because this is America, and, and you're having a big family get-together anyway, uh, but your joy turns to anger when you turn on the news and see the media and, and some of our government officials telling you that you made the bad choice. Do, and, and does your joy change based on your circumstances? The angel didn't say that Christmas would be good news of great joy only when everything about Christmas goes the way that you want. And he didn't say that it would be good news of great joy only when you felt particularly joyful. He said that the birth of Jesus would be good news of great joy that shall be for all the people, period. And I think all the people means literally all the people, past, present, and future. Jesus' birth is good news of great joy for Adam and Eve, who could only be saved through the birth of the promised seed. Uh, it's good news of great joy for all the people living in the year of Jesus' birth in, in 0 AD. And it's good news of great joy for all the people this year in 2020. It was good news in the middle of the Great Depression, and it's good news for the people in North Korea today who, who desperately need to hear it. It's good news for everyone who's ever been on the path to hell, and that's all of us. You see, we're all sinners, and we all need a Savior. And the birth of Jesus means that the Savior has come for all the people. That brings us to the book of Mark. Now, like John, uh, Mark actually doesn't include the birth of Jesus specifically, but it does say this in Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that really is the most important part. The gospel is not merely that Jesus was born, but that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, who is the Son of God who came to bring us the good news. That's, that's the emphasis throughout the book of Mark. In Mark, we see the story of the Savior who came to fulfill his promise. So we read in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, a great summary of Jesus' purpose. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the point. The good news of great joy is not just that a baby was born, but that that baby would grow up and serve us and give his life for us. So be joyful of what God has given you. Receive his gift. And then remember this, freely you have received, so freely give. Because you have great joy, others will see an illustration of God's grace and truth in you. And then, hopefully, know and receive the meaning of God's word, who is Jesus. Have you received him? Because I think it's one thing to say that you know Jesus, but quite another thing to live like it. And I'm not talking now about whether you go to church every week or, or read your Bible, although those are certainly things that Christians ought to want to do. I'm talking this morning about joy. Do you have joy in Jesus, no matter what else is going on in the world? Truly give your life to him, not holding anything back, 
and Jesus will fill you with great joy and abundant life. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you this Christmas season that we can, uh, no matter what's going on in our lives or in the world, rejoice that Jesus has come. And God, I pray that we would have um, joyful hearts, that we wouldn't get distracted um, by what we want or what we wish would have happened this year or even this Sunday. But help, help us to have joy no matter what, knowing that um, Jesus came to give us great joy. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.